The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I know that this is kind of a funky time of day, so I really appreciate everyone coming out to support the students of 2219. Uh, this is the very first time we ever offered this class. This is the very first time I've ever taught. So uh, I, it was an awesome experience for me, and hopefully it was a great experience for all the students. Uh, I am going to pull you guys up on stage at some point to talk about what it was like, just, to, just as a heads up. Um, so this class is initially called Becoming the Next Bill Nye, but uh, as many of the students might tell you, um, it's not exactly about becoming the next Bill Nye. What it is about is trying to figure out how to occupy the space that's in between education and entertainment, a space that's not very well defined, a space that doesn't have very good best practices or best practices at all. Um, but the things that are important in this space um, are to create materials that leave a door open to the world of science, technology, engineering, and math to everyone. Um, to create materials that foster a lifelong love of learning and to create materials that promote STEM literacy within the public. And these are all like super broad sweeping ideas, um, but that is sort of what I think at least defines the space that's in between education and enter entertainment. These were the four class values that we had. And sorry guys, I know you've heard this already, but this is for people <laughs> who've never been to the class. Um, because we couldn't really grade things like, is this scene well lit? Because honestly, we were asking them to do so much within the span of two or three weeks. Um, these were the values that were important to us. Do the materials that the students make um, exhibit a sense of spark? Is their enthusiasm for the topic matter very evident? And this doesn't mean that they're talking with their hands, waving all the time. It doesn't mean that they're acting like Hank Green with like super hyper personality. It just means that their genuine love of the material is evident. Um, is it clear, kill your darlings is like the phrase I used over and over again, but you know, are you able to really determine and distill what your message is very clearly? Are you thoughtful? Is every decision that you go into making um, what your scene looks like, what your line is, what your location is, um, is that clear? And then are you pushing yourself outside of your comfort zones? Um, I think there was only one student in this class who'd ever had experience with cameras or film. Um, and I think most of the students were a little nervous about being on camera, um, which is totally understandable. It's very, very intimidating to be in front of the camera. Um, and I think that over the course of the two, three weeks, um, all these projects exhibit these values, which I'm very happy about. So what exactly happened in the last month? Well, we basically took production, which is all of this stuff, um, which I think is actually structured the wrong way. This is really what production is. Uh, and they had to learn all of it <laughs> in basically two weeks, because um, they spent the last week making their videos. And this isn't just how to turn on a camera. It's um, how to write an effective script, how to engage people, with your text and your body language and the way you're presenting things. Um, and then on top of that, they had to learn how to use all the equipment and then they had to learn how to edit sort of on their own um, and learn how to plan things and learn how all of these things interact with each other. So what you're about to see are things that they basically put together in like two or three days, which is kind of nuts. Um, and with very, very limited resources. We had like these crappy little Canon camcorders. Um, so uh, it's, it's pretty impressive when you think about the constraints that they had. Um, one of the things that we talked about was storyboarding. So I storyboarded the class for you guys. Uh, day one, if you don't remember, we talked about an intro to class. Chris Babel gave a guest lecture on sort of introduction to using the camera. Then on day two, I made the terrible decision of not telling people that we were going to have 26th graders come to the classroom. Um, but luckily, Jamie took care of that before I got there. And they basically had to pitch ideas for videos to 26th graders from Winthrop. And then Natalie Caldell came and talked a bit about her experiences uh, launching BioBuilder, which is this educational nonprofit. 
Uh, and then George came in and did a hosting workshop, if you guys remember this. This was only like two weeks ago, which is crazy. Um, and then Josh and John from Planet Nutshell gave a workshop on storyboarding. And then we had our table read. Um, and then you guys shot for the first time. And then we had another table read. Wow, did I mess up my pictures? Sorry. Uh, and then we talked about post-production. You guys literally learned the philosophy of editing in two hours. Uh, and then you went off to film your episodes. Um, and then we had one screening. And then, what, two, two more days passed, one, one day passed, and then we're, to, we're here at today. So it was a, a very condensed, very expedited version of all that stuff in the web that I showed earlier. Um, so speaking of storyboards, we are at our first project. This was Yulia's first storyboard. And yes, I combed through the Tumblr, and I'm pulling up all the embarrassing first drafts of everything that po people posted. Um, Yulia's first storyboard, and I'm bummed because the text is super small and you can't see it, but it's her first version of her script. Um, and it was basically her first attempt at planning what her video was going to be. And the intro was, you know, what do a snowflake and, and a cell phone have in common? And her plan was to go out by the Charles, maybe while it was snowing. And then she's going to have all these scenes about fractals and how fractals are everywhere. Fractals are crazy. They're on broccoli. Oh my gosh, so many fractals. Um, and, then, and then she starts talking about fractals. Um, Yulia, do you mind coming on up here? Um, what was the process like? And I'm going to give this to you too. What was the process like going from this storyboard to the video that we're about to see? Um, well, I mostly changed the script since since this storyboard, um, but this kind of helped me think through what are some possible locations I'm going to film at, um, what animations I can use. So this was very important for me to kind of imagine what was happening, but not just in my script, but also how it would look on film. And then I noticed that there were some issues with the storyboard, and then changed the script afterwards. And how your script probably changed the most. Well, there, there were some drastic changes that happened, but from your very first idea from, for, from day one, your um, your thought was to do something about math, but how math wasn't real. It was like this very philosophical idea, and it was awesome, but we had no idea how she would tell it in five minutes. Um, so how did it evolve over the course, or what were some of the, the challenges that you had revising it? Um, so I started with talking about Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which asks the question of, is math real? And then I pitched that idea to sixth graders, and I came back, and I was really shocked that I ever thought that I could explain that to sixth graders. So then I had to think, well, what else can I tell about math? Um, and I like theoretical math, so all of the concepts that I like in math are abstract and don't really have a concrete application. So I started freaking out, and then eventually I came up with this idea of fractals, which were doodles, and they were present everywhere in nature, so it could be made relatable, it could be made concrete, even though it was this very um, abstract math concept. So that was the third script that I wrote. Um, that was about fractals and chaos theory. Then I wrote another one, which didn't talk about chaos theory, because that was also complex. Um, so the issue for me was coming up with a topic that I could enjoy talking about, but also sixth graders would enjoy hearing about. And in the process, I also realized that um, I need more help than I thought and more practice than I thought. So it was, it was a very humbling experience, especially the table reads. Um, and how do you feel about your final video? I mean, again, like what they're working with are these small cameras. Um, most of them had never touched the camera really before. Uh, none of them had used editing software except for maybe like one or two. So um, how do you feel about the final product that we're about to see? 
Um, well, I'm not very happy with the quality of the video. And I think part of it is I had to transfer between computers and work with software. Um, there are definitely some scenes I would refilm if I had more time to get better lighting and better sound. Um, and it's only three and a half minutes long, so I could definitely add more math to it. But I think that yesterday when I uploaded it, I was pretty happy with what I got in the time that I had. Awesome. Okay, well, we'll watch your video. What do snowflakes and cell phones have in common? The answer is never-ending patterns called fractals. To explain, let me start by drawing a snowflake. First, I draw an equilateral triangle. Divide each side into three parts and draw another equilateral triangle on top of each one. Then take out the middle and repeat the process, this time with one, two, three, four, times three, which is 12 sides. Eventually, the shape will start looking something like this. In mathematics, this is called a cock snowflake. If I repeated my process again and again, I would see this same pattern anywhere I looked. This is a cock snowflake, this time drawn on a computer. Such never-ending patterns that on any scale, on any level of zoom, look roughly the same, are called fractals. Computer scientists can program these patterns by repeating an often simple mathematical process over and over. In the 1990s, a radio astronomer by the name of Nathan Cohen used fractals to revolutionize wireless communications. At the time, Cohen was having troubles with his landlord. The man wouldn't let him put an antenna on his roof. So, Cohen designed a more compact fractal radio antenna instead. The landlord didn't notice it, and it worked better than the ones before. Working further, Cohen designed a new antenna, this time using a fractal called the Mender Sponge. The Mender Sponge is not really the sponge you'd be scrubbing your back with, but you can still think of it like that. Imagine both water and soap getting through your sponge of holes, except the water is Wi-Fi and the soap is, say, Bluetooth. The fractal's infinite sponginess allows it to receive many different frequencies simultaneously. Before Cohen's invention, antennas had to be cut for one frequency, and that was the only frequency they could operate at. Without Cohen's sponge, your cell phone would have to look something like a hedgehog to receive multiple signals, including the one your friends use when they call. Cohen later proved that only fractal shapes could work with such a wide range of frequencies. Today, millions of wireless devices, such as laptops and barcode scanners, use Cohen's fractal antenna. Cohen's genius invention, however, was not the first application of fractals in the world. Nature has been doing it the whole time, and not just with snowflakes. Natural selection favors the most efficient systems of organisms, often in a fractal form. The spiral fractal, for example, is present in seashells, broccoli, and hurricanes. The fractal tree is relatively easy to program and can be used to study river systems, blood vessels, and lightning bolts. So many natural systems previously thought off limits to mathematicians can now be understood in terms of fractals. <coughs> Mathematics allows us to learn each of those practices and then apply them to solve real-world problems. Much like Cohen's antenna revolutionized telecommunications, other fractal research is changing medicine, weather prediction, and art here at MIT and everywhere in the world. Look around you, what beautiful patterns do you see? I forgot to mention, so obviously if a student's on screen hosting, they are not filming their own project. Um, so what we did was paired people up into groups and they filmed each other. So. Um, that piece was filmed by Kenneth and PJ, um, and they all worked together to help each other out and direct each other, and it was awesome. Um, next up, we have PJ. Now, PJ, for you, you can come on up. Uh, I took your second pitch from uh, the Tumblr posts, <laughs> where you had come up with the idea of talking about ships. His first Yes. Oh. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, you had come up with the idea of talking about uh, the science behind poached eggs. 
and and um, I. <laughs> How, how, did, how, an egg, so. how did that turn from um, the science of poached eggs to what ended up being a video about how ships basically don't sink? Um, well, honestly, I was trying to look for something easy, and um, poaching eggs isn't actually that easy. So, like, I, I wanted to learn how to do it, and uh, I thought it'd be something where I'd be able to present on something and also learn something myself, but. Uh, also, I could just do it in my kitchen at home, so it seemed very uh, accessible. But yeah, I decided to ditch that because it's it's a lot harder than uh, people. Or I think people know it's hard to poach an egg. So. Uh, so let's watch your pitch, and then we can talk about it. Right. How it changed to your final video. Oh, can everyone see that? Okay, the, can I leave the backlight on? Let us assume for a second that this cardboard box I hold in front of you is a ship. Let's say it's a box barge. It kind of looks like a barge. Now, what I've done for you is drawn a water line. And what that is, is that is the level at which the barge will float on top of the water, assuming that it's going to float. Now, if I take these scissors and create damage to the bow section of this barge, what do you think would happen? You'd probably be right in saying that water is going to go through this hole that I've created, fill up in the barge, and that the barge is going to sink. Now, let's take that same scenario and do it again. So you're going to damage this bow portion right here. Now what do you think would happen? You'd probably say that, well, you just did that, so it's going to sink. Water's going to come in that hole and it's going to sink the ship. But you'd be wrong. What I did is I took these cardboard pieces right here and subdivided the vessel. And what that means is that when water comes in through this hole, it's just going to fill up this compartment. Now what that's going to do, it's going to cause a trim condition in the barge, but it's not going to sink. And people on board are not going to be injured as a result of the vessel sinking. Now, I'll show you this example as a segue into what naval architects do. One of the most important features of designing a ship is making sure it's not going to sink, as easy as it sounds. And the way that you do that is through subdivision. So I showed that because um, basically the difference between this and the video about you're about to see in terms of content isn't super, super different. Like the science, the basic science behind it, isn't um, incredibly different. So what happened between you making this to you making your final video? Well, I kind of knew the, the resources that I had at MIT to do like a pretty decent job trying to show it. So um, that was tough trying to organize that, like getting the, the labs I had to go to, because I don't actually work in these labs. So it's, it was tough to schedule that. But I knew it would be possible. So I just tried to do it and had a lot of fun in the process. So. I don't think that this is actually a bad video at all. I think that you'll go on YouTube and you'll find a ton of videos just like this one where it's someone that's just set up their camera back at home and they're talking a little bit about like a physics concept. Um, which one do you like better? This one or the one that you made for the project? Oh, I like the first one better. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, the, the, the second one's definitely a little bit more in depth and kind of goes into the, the science a little bit more, so. What was the hardest part about getting to this final video? Um, I'd say, I think it was probably organizing all of it because just the different shots that I had to take and everything, it was pretty tough. But uh, it was good having Kenneth and Yulia. They, they definitely helped. Uh, I think my storyboard was kind of all over the place, but they were like, no, you should do it from this angle and you should try it from this angle. So uh, got a lot of good stuff that I could edit. And you actually said that it was easier for you to be on camera when you were around other people than being yeah. by yourself. Yeah. So, well, let's have a look at your final project. You yeah, I'm sit down.
take complex things and break them into smaller pieces, we find out that we know a lot more about things than we think. Now let's take this box four for one and create damage below the waterline, which I've indicated right here. Now let's put Oracle on the water and see what happens. The Oracle 1 sank due to the weight of the added water. But what if the Oracle 1 contained cargo, or oil, or even people? Now let's take Oracle 2 and do the same thing. So we can see that Orca 2 did not sink, although it is sitting at an angle towards the bow. So why didn't Orca 2 sink? As easy as it sounds, this simple demonstration is essential to the design of huge, complex ships. Ships are responsible for carrying about 90% of all our stuff. As naval architects, how do we design ships carrying our stuff to make it into port safely and not sink? Here we have Orca 1 and Orca 2 from the floor. Although Orca 1 and Orca 2 don't engage in international trade, they behave just as a 1,000 foot container ship would. Now let's take a look into Orca 1. We can see that there's nothing in it, it's just a box. But if we look at Orca 2, we can see that it's subdivided into these watertight compartments by these transverse watertight bulkheads. Now what that means is that if we were to damage a ship right here, water would only flow into this compartment. It would not go into this one, this one, or this one. That would cause the ship to be angled or trimmed in the water, but it would not cause the ship to sink completely. We refer to Orca 2 as being subdivided, and we can see subdivision in many of these ships' plans. It is unclear when subdivision first started being used in ships, but accounts of 5th century Chinese trade ships indicate that water would be able to enter the vessel without sinking. So let's find out why this happens. Let's imagine a barge divided into 10 equal compartments. One of them springs a leak from damage. Since the ship is subdivided, only the first compartment floods and the ship remains afloat, protecting both its people and cargo. Although the added water causes the ship to trim, it still has enough buoyancy to return to port for repairs. Ships still sink though. It's both expensive and impractical to try to design an unsinkable ship especially when these ships will never see that amount of damage. That's why as naval architects, we use computer programs to help us out with subdivision. Computers make it easy to simulate certain damage cases in practically no time. With different software, we can damage certain compartments and see how the ship responds to it. This gives the naval architect a good idea of what parts to improve on the ship, if any. So even though ships seem like these intricate, complex things, they're really just based on principles that we all already know. All right. So, Andrea, I don't know if you saw me mess up, but you're up to next. <laughs> I accidentally fast-forwarded through all the um, through all the slides. So I'm also going to show uh, that's that's just the sound that's there. Oh, the, you can't see. Oh, shouldn't have done that. Uh, here we go. So Andrea, you can come on up. Um, so I'm going to show the second pitch that you did. Um, I guess my question for you is, you knew pretty early on what you were going to write about. I think your topic stayed pretty much the same, but the way that you were saying it changed a lot over the course of the class. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I guess what was the um, the most important thing that you learned in the past few weeks? Oh gosh, the most important thing. Or maybe the most practical thing. Yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Woo. Okay, two things. Persistence and iteration. <laughs> um, and uh, the persistence was by far the harder thing to really do because, you know, I'd experience a block at something. You know, the, my first one was that I was too much in like sort of businesswoman presenting information mode, um, and it wasn't very authentic. Um, and I didn't think I, I was like, you know, I'm not trying to sell orthodontics to sixth graders. That's kind of ridiculous. I'm trying is to, <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, teach them about science. Um, so, you know, it was just a series of blocks that I really just had to work through, much like life. Um, what type of advice would you give to anyone who, uh, who's going to give a talk, who's going to make a video, just anyone who's trying to communicate their technical ideas to a lay audience? Because you come from a very interesting background. So Andrea's a Sloan Fellow, um, so she has a sense of presentation and communication minus the video. Um, so I guess drawing on all these experiences, what type of advice would you give to folks? Well, I think the, f the first time you ever try to present information, you think you're going to get through a lot more information that, than you actually will. And that was the first thing that I learned when I taught. Um, I went in with a lesson plan of like 20 things, and, and I only got through like maybe four. So I think that's, that's your first lesson is keep it simple initially. My name's Andrea DeRocher, and uh, I'm a Sloan Fellow, as I mentioned earlier. And my pitch idea is actually having to do with something that I actually know something a little bit about um, that many high school or middle schoolers also struggle with, and that is having braces. Um, I just recently got my braces off, and I also work for an orthodontics company before I came here to MIT. So. Um, it's something that's both near and dear to my heart, and also I think uh, I've seen a lot of high schoolers and middle schoolers struggle with this whole process. I know I didn't know a whole lot about it. Um, so basically, that would be my pitch, is to teach kids about what's happening with their teeth as they're having braces on, how the teeth move, how osteoblasts and osteoclasts work, and to deposit and uh, dissolve some of their bone, which is actually one of the reasons why it hurts so much. Um, and also why your mouth gets dry, all those kinds of scientific aspects is something that these kids really, you know, deal with on a, on a daily basis during a very awkward time of their lives. So that's my mini pitch. So before we see your video, um, what's one thing that you're really proud of and one thing that you would want to change if you had more time or more resources? Okay, that's a, that's a really hard question. <laughs> I'd, I'd change the whole thing, but um, the one thing that, that I liked about it is that I, I tried to keep my sense of humor in the video. Um, and uh, the one thing that I wish I could change is learning more about lighting and editing and uh, just more of the technical details. one of the great pleasures and necessities of life, and to enjoy everything from energy bars to apples, we rely on one part of our bodies to do an important job, our teeth. Teeth are the hardest substances in our bodies. They're harder than our bones, and they're even harder than iron or steel. So why doesn't our jaw just crumble under all of those forces? Between your tooth and your jawbone, there's a specialized piece of tissue called the periodontal ligament or PDL for short. The PDL can easily absorb the normal forces that a tooth experiences when we chew, say, an apple, cushioning or protecting our jawbone from our teeth. Teeth sound like they're already perfectly designed, but sometimes we really need to force them in a certain direction, like with braces. 
As the braces slowly force the teeth to move, the PDL is squeezed in one direction and stretched in the other. To make room, the mechanoreceptors receptors in the PDL trigger cells called osteoclasts that actually come in and dissolve part of your jaw to make extra room. The mechanoreceptors receptors also trigger another kind of cell called an osteoblast, which comes in and builds up part of the jawbone. This allows the PDL to get back into its regular cushioning shape, thus holding the tooth securely in position. So if braces use osteoblasts to physically reposition teeth for cosmetic reasons, what if we want to use them to replace things in our bodies? Dental implants replace teeth that are damaged or missing to restore chewing function. Your jaw isn't the only place where these osteoblasts and osteoclasts are altering your bone structure. In fact, this bony remodeling process is happening throughout your entire body. And these implants aren't just limited to teeth. Doctors can replace knees, hips, even spinal discs. And MIT engineers are using the properties of osteoblasts and osteoclasts that are already in our bodies to create a chemical coating for these implants. Just like in a mouth with braces, this coating helps create natural bone to help lock the implant into place. Right now, these implants are designed to have the exact same functionality as the parts that they're replacing. But scientists are already developing implants to improve the performance of our bodies and brains. So at that point, will we be more a machine than human? So Nathan, why don't you come on up? Um, every day the students had to write a daily reflection on our class blog, which is open to anyone. Any one of you guys can go see it if you want. Um, and this is in addition to doing all the assignments that they had to do. But they would just talk about what the day was like, what they learned, what was um, challenging, just any thoughts. And they could either post pictures or write things or make video blogs. Um, and Nathan, by far, had like the most entertaining <laughs> vlogs. And I, I'm just going to show you it, and then we can talk about it. Um, All right, second day down. Oh, wait, Nathan, can you scoot over? Oh, whoops. All right, second day down. Oh, now, third. Third day. So, third day. All right, so third day reflection, a lot happening, um, so much, okay, actually. So I guess I'll start with the first thing that pops into mind, which is shooting. I just got done finally finishing my trailer pitch thing, and one thing I guess you always know but you don't appreciate is how many tries at shooting something it takes to get something you're satisfied with because, oh my gosh, I don't still really like what I've come out with, but I spent a good hour and a half <laughs> repeating the same thing over and over again, and I don't know. I am okay with what came of it because I know it's still very, very rough, and that's the point of it. So. So that's part of his day three blog. Um, so the reason why I said sort of becoming the next Bill Nye is that uh, what I didn't want, want to end up happening was people thinking that this class was about molding them into some science celebrity that was becoming the next Bill Nye or is becoming the next Neil deGrasse Tyson or becoming the next Hank Green. Um, because what I think is so awesome about what is here in the student body and what um, what everyone in this class brought was their own individual personalities, and I would have um, hated it if Nathan was trying to be uh, Bill Nye because he's so much better as Nathan, um, and that's why his blogs are so great. Um, so Nathan, what was, uh, I, I know that you had said it was hard to be on camera and it was hard to do production, but your blogs are so effortless and your video blogs are, um, like they're very you, so what was so hard about doing something when you had a line to say? Um, I think what made it so hard um, was 
if I'm just like doing a blog sort of thing, I like think of it in a way of like, oh, I'm just talking to someone. Um, but when I'm trying to go with the script, it becomes a lot more formal in my mind, and I just get nervous. <laughs> Um, how do you feel about how the video that we're about to watch turned out? How do you feel about your hosting? What was it like shooting that? Um, I think there's still a lot that I think could be better about it. But if I look back at like the, fir the very first pitch video I did, and the second one, and even the rough cut, it's definitely improved. So what I'll take you, what I can. What are you most proud of um, in your final project? Um, probably that I remember when we did the day th the uh, first table reads of scripts um, mine was one a lot different from it is now but also very very long and now it took like you know about a little over five minutes to read through just on the table which is in theory faster than it would be in a video and the whole Kill Your Darlings thing happened, and I ended up with about two and a half minute long video. So I think that's what I like most. Okay. Well, let's see what we got. Why does a fridge start to smell? And where does that icky black liquid come from? Wouldn't life just be easier if things didn't rot? If things lasted forever? Well, maybe, but probably not. The average American household wastes about 25% of its food, and a lot of restaurants are even worse. So if we didn't have decomposition, what would happen to all the food we throw away? Food in landfills usually get settled by bacteria, protists, and fungi who allow nutrients in the food to return to the soil and eventually other living things. These decomposers also break down other dead stuff, like trees. In fact, they're pretty much the only thing that can eat wood. So even if in a world without rot, you don't have to worry about your house getting eaten by termites who rely on photos in their stomach, pretty soon forests and landfills will be flooded with a lot of dead stuff. How do we avoid this problem? Well, basically in your fridge, on a forest floor, in a dumpster, almost anywhere there are fungi, bacteria, and photos that live entirely by eating dead stuff. These dead things can be more or less divided into three categories carbohydrates, sugar and starches, lipids, think fats, and proteins, like meats. All of these are chemically different, so they each get broken down by different enzymes in different ways before being absorbed by decomposers. For example, proteases break down proteins into amino acids, the cell's building blocks. Lipids rely on lipases, and carbohydrates on things like amylase and cellulases. So how does a perfectly nice broccoli forex by giving off this foul black liquid? Fruits and vegetables are almost entirely made of water, so on the most basic level you can see the cells are like extremely complex water balloons. The exterior of the cell wall is made of cellulose, a complex carbohydrate that gets broken down by enzymes into small sugars that cells can get energy from. When bacteria or fungi uses cellulases to eat the exterior of the cell, it's like if I were to pop the balloon. That's the muck you see in your fridge. What about that stink? For fruits and vegetables, a lot of time this all happens after the icky black liquid forms. Other bacteria that weren't involved in the initial colonization move in and start to stink everything up. Meat gets smelly when lipases break down fat in the meat into glycerol and fatty acids, two energy sources. And fatty acids are kind of gross. And so while your food rotting may smell absolutely terrible, because of it, the environment doesn't recycle crucial nutrients it needs. And, well, that's why we have all this. All right, so David, you can come on up. Um, as I was saying, the students all have to post daily blogs. And after the first day, I was really curious to read um, what everyone thought about the class, how they were feeling. And David's was one of the first ones I read. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it says, today was the first day in the class of MIT 219. I felt pretty much overwhelmed with the amount of coursework required from the get-go, but also pleasantly surprised by the amount of enthusiasm from students and teachers alike in the course. This will be a day of many firsts then. 
First time making a blog, first time using Tumblr, first time making a video describing something myself. Previously, we had done it in a group setting and it wasn't such a good experience. Uh, so I read that and I was like, oh no, <laughs> I have totally misgaged uh, everyone's you know, starting level. Like I gave, I gave too much to do. Um, this is going to be an interesting month. Um, how do you feel now? You not only have mastered Tumblr, but you, you're uploading videos, you're making videos on your own. Um, was it as bad of an experience as the first one? Um, actually, actually, I felt that it was much better, really a lot much better. And I'm very grateful for all the help that we've been, we've been getting from all, of, all the teaching staff. And at first, at first I was really, um, because the first few times that we made video, I was quite demoralized because uh, the video came out quite badly. And then when I watched it, I was like, well, cringing at the videos. So, um, like, because of, but I, th I feel that it's because uh, when we did the videos, right, most of the time I was doing it by myself. So I couldn't have another person to, like, shoot it against, to let the, pers let the person uh, tell me what is good, what is bad about the video. However, in this class, every day we have, like, opinions given to us as to what we can improve, what we can take out, what is better, what to cut. And so I think through this process, right, we have improved our videos much more than we could have alone. Um, and I forgot to mention, so the last three videos that I'm going to show are from um, SUTD students. So we got to host a few students um, who are from the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Um, and it was super interesting having all of your guys' perspectives. I was thinking before the class started, like, how is this going to work? Like, you know, culturally, are people going to have the same sort of digital media literacy? And I feel like you guys were like, oh yeah, we've seen SciShow, we've seen Veritasio. I'm like, we already know all about these YouTube channels. So um, I was like, oh, okay, this is gonna be totally fine. <laughs> um, but David, uh, going back to, Sing you guys are going back to Singapore tomorrow morning. Um, do you think that you will take any of the things that we did in class, um, either maybe making more videos or um, in your talks or what, what types of things were most useful to you? I don't think that I'll be making more videos because <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really I think it's really quite hard and to do it really need a lot of people to do with you. Uh, but one thing I'll take back is uh, how to give effective feedback because I actually feel that in this class uh, many of times the feedback was very effective and it came across very pleasantly. So I'm very thankful for that. All right. Okay. Well, let's see your final project. If I went up or run now, dress like this, you'd probably call me nuts, right? Because it's so cold outside that I'll probably die of hypothermia. However, in 2009, Wim Hof managed to run a full marathon in minus 20 degrees Celsius wearing nothing but shorts. While most people will probably die, Wim Hof has managed to survive. So, what makes Wim Hof able to survive while others can't? To research him, researchers in the Netherlands subjected him to an icy bath for almost two hours. Well, most people would have their core body temperature drop to below 35 degrees, causing hypothermia to kick in. Wim Hof's body temperature dropped to merely 37.4 degrees Celsius, staying surprisingly warm. And the funny thing is that the researchers couldn't find exactly what had happened. Maybe it's his genetic ancestry that saved him. In a separate study, scientists have found that individuals with cold climate ancestry have mitochondria that can produce more heat and less chemical energy. Mitochondria is like a mini furnace that burns the sugars from the food we eat into chemical and heat energy. Individuals like this will be better able to survive the cold. However, scientists haven't fully studied Wim Hof's genome, so we don't really know. Wim Hof practices g tomo a better form of meditation and breathing, which allows him to double his metabolism. Remember the mitochondria I mentioned before? Wim Hof can produce enough heat through his mitochondria with specific breathing and muscle contractions They can produce enough heat to keep his body warm. Well, you might believe that this is not scientific. However, studies at any rate have shown that participants to increase their core body temperature using GPOMO and they have a prior meditation experience. Now, why could this be so? Increases in alpha and beta waves to notice. And many have theorized that this has enabled the body 
effectively hit the center as well as distribute it to the extremity. We do not fully understand Wim Hof's method, and while some have tried to follow in his footsteps, it would be unwise to do the same. And Wim Hof even claims that he can control other parts of his body. Now, if this were true and scientifically backed, who knows what doors could open? While well, science hasn't escaped it all yet, and I myself don't practice Wim Hof's method, maybe I better be off for more jacket. Show your pitch first, and then we can talk about it. Everyone has pretty much seen a science fiction movie in this day and age, and I'm pretty sure everyone has seen at least one that involves time traveling. Maybe it's Star Trek, Interstellar, or more recently, Predestination. And it's such a widely explored topic in science fiction, the whole genre of time traveling. But many times, Hollywood films always have this little, little loopholes in their storyline and their plot lines, and they often use um, weird theories and science to explain themselves, which are just like God from the machine solutions, totally not efficient. However, scientists have actually put forward three main theories when it comes to time traveling. The first theory, the fixed timeline theory. Say, for example, you're trying to prevent World War II and you travel back in time after inventing a time machine, and after killing the baby that was supposed to be Hitler, you put I don't know, some other baby you found in the orphanage and put it in the same cot. However, when you travel back in the future, you realize that the baby that you had replaced it with was the one that turned out to be Hitler. And there is no changing of the past effectively or the future or the present. It's all in a fixed timeline. And this particular this particular motions are actually often seen in movies such as um, Harry Potter. It was seen in it was seen in um, Interstellar as well. It was also seen in Predestination. It's a good film. You have to catch it. The second theory is the multiverse theory, which says that every time you go back in time and you alter the history, for example, you step on a butterfly, and that butterfly could actually maybe be the prevention of, I don't know, a hurricane that sweeps through Orlando right now. You spot a new set of events, which is which happens in a separate universe, which. In other words, it means that you have actually got infinite number of universes after you have all these different decisions and different chain of events occurring. And this particular timeline concept has actually been explored many times as well. It's been featured in the recent reboot of Star Trek movies. It's also been featured in it's also been featured in the recent Fringe series, which kind of died because JJ Abrams ran out of money or something. And <laughs> Yeah, this multiple series is actually quite popular because it's the easiest for producers uh, to just throw the solution in there and then say, oh, we actually spawn off a new timeline, so that's when you get sloppy and lazy. <laughs> the third theory we have is what we call the dynamic timeline theory. It's also the theory which induces all the paradoxes which you often hear about. It's paradoxes such as the grandfather paradox, where you go back in time and you kill a grandfather and because you kill your grandfather, you won't exist, and because you won't exist, you can go back inside and kill your grandfather, and that's where the whole paradox comes in. Who kills who? God knows. The third theory we have is called the dynamic timeline theory, which is also where all your grandfather paradoxes come in. Let's say your grandfather is a really, really evil man, and you have to go back inside to kill him. And you go back, you do the deed, and then you realize that, oh no, after I kill him, I can't exist. And because you can't exist, you can't go back in time to kill him. And because of that, he comes back, and then after that, you have to come back, and you have to go back in time again and kill him. And that's where the paradox starts. It's an infinite circle of never-ending events, and that's how the grandfather paradox came about to be in the first place. And I think you may have you may have seen it in like Back to the Future, and I can't really think of any other film right now. So this is a brief history of time travel and the three theories associated with it, as well as a quick touch on the paradox of grandfather's paradox. All right, come on up, Kenneth. So of the four values, I don't know if you all remember, but there's spark, there's clarity, there's uh, thoughtfulness, and there's challenge, right? Kenneth 
obviously is not lacking in spark whatsoever, which is awesome. Like as soon as you see this video, and this was the very first thing you did, and you have some video experience, right? Yeah, I have. And if I had known this would be shown, I would have put on more clothes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I have had um, some. So the, the video technique was there, and um, the enthusiasm for the subject matter was definitely there. So how did you go from this pitch, which is basically you know, its own video. It's kind of like, you know, a, a mini sci-show video, basically, on all the theories of time travel. How'd you go from this to the video we're about to see? So, um, this was talking about the three main theories of time travel, and this happened right before we saw the sixth graders. And when I started talking to the sixth graders, I realized that most of them haven't seen uh, Interstellar or all these new Star Trek movies. Funnily enough, they have seen Back to the Future. So, yeah. Um, and I realized it, what really intrigued them about time travel wasn't like all these paradoxes or all these theories or the timeline. They were more interested in like, how is it possible? Is it even possible? And other questions. So it wasn't, it was, they were interested in time travel, just not my scope that I initially planned. So I decided to change it up a bit, maybe talk more about the science of time travel itself, which is where I went to at the end. Yeah. yeah. I mean, something to emphasize too, we talked about it on the first day, that this space is so hard to work in because what is good is not defined by anyone. Um, so just because the sixth graders wanted you to talk about the exact science of time travel and we encourage you to do that, that doesn't necessarily mean that this video is bad or that um, people wouldn't really be into a video about like the science behind interstellar. That's not true at all. Um, so part of the challenge in working in this space is knowing, you know, who to sacrifice, what audience to sacrifice when you decide to make your video. Um, what were some of the new or unexpected things that you had learned that you didn't know about um, production or? Sound is important. Sound, sound, is, sound important. is really, really important. Um, yeah, if I, if I had more time, I would reshoot some of the scenes because the sound was it's just so bad. Um, other things, uh, I realized my writing and my speaking is really, really very different. My, my initial script, when we first wrote it out, I think it was about seven, six to seven minutes long. My final cut is short of four minutes. So I, I think while filming, it's really a big difference to how, how we bring things, how, we, how I brought things across. It feels a lot more natural to speak just on ad lib through the camera. And yeah. Awesome. Any final thoughts before we show yours? Be forgiving. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Imagine holding a party and then sending out the invitations after the party. Oh, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Are, are my friends going to be able to time travel back just to attend my party? In 2009, Stephen Hawking actually conducted such an experiment to disprove time travel. What, what exactly is time travel and how does it work? It actually has a lot to do with speed! A lot of what we know about time traveling actually comes from Einstein's theory of special and general relativity. We are actually time traveling right now, but not in the manner as sci-fi films have depicted them. We are, in fact, time traveling at a pace of one hour per hour. In other words, every hour I experience, the world around me experiences a singular hour too. Now, it may sound simple and trivial, but stay with me, this is where it gets interesting. Now, a large part of Einstein's theory of special relativity is actually a phenomenon known as time dilation. Effectively, this means that the faster you travel, the slower time passes around you. It potentially means that I could travel at maybe more than one hour per hour. This phenomenon, however, is only noticeable at really, really high speeds. Speeds near the speed of light. This rocket here, not even close. Say I do have a spaceship now that travels at 90% the speed of light. And I have a pair of newborn twins. I bring one of them with me on this journey for 10 years. When I return, one of them will have turned 23 years old, while the one with me will have only turned 10 years old. While we have experienced 10 years on a spaceship, 23 years have actually passed on Earth. This amount of time actually increases exponentially as we get closer to the speed of light. So, we could essentially travel all of the time. But what about backwards in time? That's a lot of issue. Now, remember our previous graph? The time that it took that passed on Earth was essentially to the speed of light. Let's sum 
promising main in the sequence time travel lies on the other side of the line. In other words, we may have to travel faster than the speed of light just to be able to travel back in time. Now, when you do travel at speed to the speed of light, something called relativistic mass comes into play. In other words, as your speed goes up, your mass increases. As your mass increases, you require more energy to move the same object. This might mean that we need an infinite amount of energy just to move an object beyond the speed of light. However, the more energy you put into an object, the more likely you are to increase its mass rather than to decrease its speed. Therefore, to get a very fast speed of light, quite impossible at this point in time. So, why are we still so obsessed with time travel? Time travel does come with its own set of problems. Take for example my party before. If I were to send out my invitations after the party, my friends would have come back in time to attend it. And if they did come back in time to attend it, I wouldn't have to have sent out my invitations. And if I didn't send out my invitations, they wouldn't be at my party. It doesn't make any sense at all that they are both at my party and not at my party. This is what we call the grandfather paradox. It's one of three time travel theories that we currently have. Now, so it seems that we may not be able to time travel yet based on what physics tells us at least. For now, if you are having a party, be sure to send out the invites first. Your friends can't time travel yet. We have one more video. Joshua, I'm going to show your day three blog. This was the day after uh, we had our hosting and script writing workshop. I thought uh, that really stood out for me was uh, the, the one on uh, looking at a member of your audience, like your family member or a professor behind the camera. So it's not just a camera. So I mean, uh, yeah, but the funny thing is speaking of this, I kind of forgot it and I'm looking at the camera thinking of the camera <laughs> so it's a bit ironic I guess many of these things require a lot of practice and that's kind of like what I need to do and get out of the zone of thinking that I'm in front of a camera I mean usually every time you press a camera there's this red button sometimes I think maybe if that red button was eliminated uh, a lot of things would be different um, yeah so I mean I guess one of my questions I would like to ask is as well is what kind of face, what, what would be an appropriate member of the audience that I would like to put there? I mean, if I put someone who is very um, respectable, like my professor, then I guess the, the whole tone, tonality of my voice, the whole choice of my vocabulary would, you know, try to be more serious. But at the same time, I guess, um, if I put someone like a two-year-old in my imagination in front of the camera, I, I'll probably not talk in the same tonality. <laughs> so, yeah, so I guess what would an appropriate member of the audience be in front of the camera? Um, well, some of. So, um, that's a very hard question, and you can come on up. Um, and the thing that's hard when you're hosting is that there's a difference between talking to and talking for your audience, which is a point that George brought up during the workshop. Uh, but being able to actually implement that, as you mentioned, it, it's really hard. So what was, um, what did you think of when you were hosting? Uh, because I think that the way you talk in this blog is totally appropriate for a sixth grader, for your professor. Um, but being able to distill like who you are as an individual and having the self-awareness to process, like this is how I really, this is who I am, like at my core, that's actually a really hard thing to do. So. How are you able to do it in your final video? Um, and you can just clip that to yourself. I guess, so the most important thing is remember your script. <laughs> so so you, at least you know what you're going to speak. And then you, you probably just want to focus on being yourself because uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, we don't want to be in Bill Nye, so we want to be ourselves. And, but we must be clear. So you have to balance those two <laughs> objectives, yeah. And uh, this is just me just talking, you know, off my head, but I, I had no objective uh, coming into these reflections. Uh, yeah, the question was interesting because it was just bef 
it was the day after. Am I am I right? To say it was the day after the <laughs> the students came in, yeah. and if you saw my first day pitch, that was extremely embarrassing. Thank God for not showing it's it. Not bad. It's really not that bad. I I, I was explaining like hashing, and, and it was like some security concept that's so hazy that. <laughs> It's, a, it's actually, it was a, a quite a good video. It was very clear, succinct. I now know that my password is safe on Facebook just as long as I update it every now and then. Yeah, but, yeah. but I, I've now understood my audience. And so the point of this video, and hopefully what I wanted to show was like something very accessible, something you use every day. And it goes deeper and deeper until it goes to a concept that you, you're not very familiar with. But because you started off at a very familiar point, it, it, it led you there. And so I, I guess that's the exciting part of the K-12 videos, yeah. Awesome. That was a point that Chris Babel brought up a lot, was taking the familiar and making it unfamiliar, or taking the unfamiliar and making it familiar. And I think this video that we're about to see does a great job of taking something that's familiar to all of us and showing sort of the unfamiliar side of it. Yeah. Any final thoughts before we show it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't cringe, <laughs> but it's good. It's good. I, I, I better hide under the table. No, no. <laughs> okay. Hi, have you found it particularly difficult to find a specific item in your house? Let's say you're looking for a pair of gloves, but you just can't find it and you spend the entire afternoon looking for it. Well, you've just encountered the same problem that companies like Google or Microsoft encounter every single day. And that's the problem of search. Just like the house which stores thousands of different items, Google stores 45 billion index pages of information. For well, if every page was a sheet of paper and you stack them up real high, you'll create a tower 600 times taller than Mount Everest. Well, how can Google find my results so quickly when I find it so difficult to find a pair of gloves? Well, searching on Google is kind of like looking for a person in a big school. Let's say you're looking for James in a row of classrooms. Well, the easiest method would be to go to every classroom nearest to you until you find James. There's a better method called binary search. Now let's say the students were arranged from A to Z, one in each classroom. We would then go to the middle room first and see if James is there. And if James isn't there, we will look at the first letter in the name. And if the letter is before J, we head to the right. If not, we head to the left. We then approach the middle room in the newly sectioned area. Eventually, we will repeat the process over and over again until we find James. Now, this is just like the first method, but it's at a much, much faster rate. How much faster would that be? Well, that depends on the number of students in the school. Let's say there are 500 students and we're looking for one. It will take about 80 minutes in the first method, but one and a half minutes with binary search. But let's say there are 1,000 students in the school, it will take 160 minutes with the first method, but 1.6 minutes with the second method. Now that's a whole lot of difference. So a name is just a word, but Google searches a combination of words, making it a little bit more complicated. So just like how we identify the first letter of each alphabet of the name, Google identifies 200 unique factors, making your search terms faster. Well, if you recall, the effectiveness of binary search depends on the pre-arrangement of data. And that's why computer scientists are actively looking for ways to sort, manage, and eventually retrieve data faster and better. In the same way, the TV remote goes near the TV, the shoes go to the shoe rack, the coats go into the cupboard, and the winter gloves go into the winter jacket. Aha! So that's where my gloves are. Okay, so uh, like I said, um, given the incredibly small amount of time and the 
small amount of resources they had. I think that these videos are pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive what they were all able to achieve in such a short amount of time. Um, we didn't even really hit music, um, which is like an entirely separate time consuming thing. Um, but well done, everyone. Big hand of applause for everyone. Um, I wanted to thank all the teaching staff who made this class possible. Sarah, our awesome TA, Jamie, the co-instructor. We had George Zayden come and teach hosting. We had the guys from Planet Nutshell, uh, Josh and John, come and teach script writing. Chris Babel taught a lot of um, how to make the, the camera techniques advance your narrative. So it was really a collaborative effort to make this class happen, just like um, hopefully you guys realize how much of a collaborative effort it takes to make a video. So um, big thank you to everyone who made the class possible. So all of these videos and uh, everyone's stuff is up on our Tumblr if you guys are interested. I don't know when we're going to offer this class again. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, but in the meantime, best wishes to all the students from Singapore who are going back tomorrow. And then the remaining students, um, I've talked to most of you guys, but uh, waiting to hear back from one person, uh, we'll be, produce, we'll be producing uh, their videos for Science Out Loud season three next week, in addition to a few more that we've been um, developing in parallel to this class. So maybe when the spring semester rolls out, you'll not only be able to see their progress from pitch to script to second script to rough cut to final project, you'll also be able to see their final product in um, the videos that we produce for them, which is going to be really exciting. And uh, big thanks to OpenCourseWare, too, for helping document this class. Um, it'll be interesting to see that roll out this summer as well. Um, but feel free to take, if there's food left, feel free to take it. There's plenty of salad left, which is unsurprising. Um, uh, but other than that, thanks so much for coming out. Um, feel free to, I'm going to volunteer the students. If you want to ask them about their experiences, you can. Uh, other than that, have a great evening. And thanks again, everyone.